This podcast is brought to you by LMU Munich. there's just so much machinery that goes into calculating pretty much anything. So what are we going to do? Well, as Michael said, the first thing we should do is make sure we know why we're calculating what we calculate. So we're going to begin by looking, and we're going to do this today, and today's going to be pretty relaxed. We're not really going to do any algebraic geometry today. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to look at how algebraic varieties come into string theory, why they're interesting, and in particular, what we give up be able to use algebraic geometry, and you pay a price to use algebraic geometry in string theory. So, you know, if you're going to restrict yourself and by using algebraic varieties in, in studying string compactifications, you better get something back for that, and in, with algebraic geometry you certainly do, you get a, a vast amount of calculational power. So what we're going to do, the, the course is going to be roughly, as I said, sp split into three lectures. The first lecture we're going to talk about why you should bother. The second lecture, we're going to really start to look at some calculations. And as I said, if you proved everything step by step, it would be very hard to get anywhere for the, the type of calculation that I'm going to look at. So instead, what I'm going to do is I'm trying, going to try and give you um, a feel for the structure of the calculation and how you put various techniques together to get a result. So, for example, I may not prove every single sequence I write on the board is exact. But what I will do instead is I will state the results, each of which individually can be looked up very simply, but then I will show you how these are put together to actually compute something in one of these n equals 1 compactifications. And we'll compute several different things which on the surface would be very hard to calculate. So that's going to be roughly the second lecture. And at the end of the second lecture, we're all going to be feeling fairly abstract. Right? So there's going to be lots of sequences and then suddenly numbers are coming out for the number of, I don't know, Kähler moduli of a Calabi-Yau or something. We're all going to, you know, you always, if you haven't seen this stuff before, you, you get left with the impression someone's pulling a fast one somewhere, right? It looks a little bit abstract. And so what we're going to do in the third lecture is go into more detail on one of these calculations and actually look at what you would do if you wanted to do one of these calculations on a computer. And in doing that, we'll really get into the, d the details of what the maps in these sequences are and so forth. And we'll get to the stage where we can do one big example that brings everything together, and you'll be able, by the end of it, to, on the set of manifolds that we're going to look at as example space, hopefully be able to calculate things yourself. If there's something you're interested in, the idea is just using these bits of technology I'll give you, you should be able to go away and calculate something. Um, so another thing I should say is that um, many of the points I'm going to make are rather general and don't particularly depend on what string theory you're working on. So often, not always, but often I'm going to use heterotic string theory as an example, firstly because it's the type of string theory I know best, but also because in many situations it's the simplest. For It has less form fields knocking around, so it's the simplest one to discuss for some, some uh, considerations. But most of the time what I say will have direct analogues in the other string theories, and I'll mention that when we, hit, when we, uh, we get there. And in addition, the constructions of manifolds and bundles I use also have some sort of generic properties which sort of go beyond the particular construction I'm looking at, which in those as well. Okay, so it's probably enough waffle, so um, let's start lecture one, which is going to be on compactification manifolds. So what we're going to do is we're going to ask for a particular type of compactification of heterotic string theory to four dimensions. So we're going to look for compactifications of heterotic string theory um, to a four-dimensional n equals 1 supersymmetric theory. So a four-dimensional theory that has four supercharges. So we should start by saying what our starting point is, just to make sure we're all on the same page. It's always reassuring to see a Lagrangian, so you know what theory you're talking about. Um, so the theory we're going to talk about is just at lowest order an alpha prime, so if you take the string length for zero, it's just going to be this thing. So it's the usual Neverschwartz sector, 
hydraulic string. We have just the Ricci curvature of a normal 10-dimensional metric. We have a dilaton, a scalar field. And then we have H, which is going to be, at this order, satisfying the usual uh, Bianchi identity. So it can be written, locally at least, as D of something, a two-form. So I've written up a, an action. We're never actually going to use it. Uh, and the reason we're not going to use it is what we're going to be interested in is the supersymmetry of solutions of this theory. Um, and for most of the cases we look at, if you have a supersymmetric configuration for, for this theory, it will also solve the equations of motion, given a few other constraints. So instead what we need is, if you take this action and you add on all the fermions, that of course no one ever writes down, and I'm following the trend. If you take this action, it's invariant and the Bianchi identity are invariant under a set of supersymmetry transformations, and those are the things we actually need. So the SUSY transformations for this action look like the following. So first of all, I'm just going to write down the fermionic transformations. We'll say what that is in a second. So the um, gravitational multiple here has an associated fermion called the gravitino that also has a vector index. And it transforms as follows. That's the levi shavita connection and then just um, anti-symmetric product of gamma matrices contracted with this field strength. And the supersymmetry parameters here, this fermionic parameter for the symmetry, is a 16-component spin. So it's a six-string component mandelana vial spin in 10 dimensions. Okay. What else do we have? Um, at the level I'm working, you also have one more fermion field, which is called Dilatino. And that has a similar transformation. There's a d slash acting on phi, another one of these terms involving what I invariably call the flux, the H field. Um, and again, our parameter. And there's another set of transformations for the bosons as well. And if you plug all of these into the action, it's invariant. OK, why do we care? So we're going to be looking for n equals 1 configurations. Um, so what type of um, solution to this theory will preserve n equals 1? Well, it's just like the Higgs effect in, in non-abelian gauge theories, right? If you start with uh, 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 some SU3 gauge group, say, and you have a Higgs VEV in your vacuum, what is the unbroken part of the gauge group? Well, anything that leaves the Higgs VEV alone, anything that commutes with the Higgs VEV. And it's the same thing for supersymmetry, of course. Um, if you have a background that you plug in here, a given metric and a given H field, what supersymmetry do you preserve? You preserve any of these 16 supercharges for which the change in the fields is zero, and the same for the bosonic fields. Because then the field configuration is being left alone by the transformation. The reason I haven't written up the bosonic fields is just that if you have a boson, the variation of a boson, and you have a fermionic parameter, there must be at least one fermionic field on the right-hand side, and all the fermions are going to be zero in vacuum. So these, the bosonic variations are going to be trivially um, zero for all supercharges. So what we have to do is look at these fermionic variations and ask, when do these fermionic variations preserve four out of these 16 supercharges? That's what n equals one supersymmetry is, four supercharges. Okay, to do that, we're going to make an ansatz, and a typical ansatz you may make is the following. First of all, we want four-dimensional space and we want a 6D compact space. So we're going to write our 10-dimensional manifold as some four-dimensional piece. And for now, we'll just have a direct product with a six-dimensional compact space. And we're going to take the four-dimensional space to be maximally symmetric. Okay. So in particular, it's ADS, it's De Sitter, or it's Minkowski space. If we're going to make that ansatz for the metric, the other fields in theory, the dilaton and the B field, better also respect this symmetry. So to also maintain this four-dimensional symmetry, we're going to take um, any component of the field strength with a 4D index. So let's just have, throughout the lectures, I and J run over 10D indices, A and B run over 60, and mu and U run over 4D. Any component of the metric at all with a four-dimensional index had better be zero, or it's going to pick out certain directions in four-dimensional space. Okay. It, likewise, the derivative of phi better be zero in four dimensions, because otherwise it will pick out a particular direction in four-dimensional space. So this is our ansatz. We have um, certain components of the field strength, certain derivatives of phi, 
and uh, a maximum symmetric space. If we do that, um, there's an associated decomposition of our spinner parameter, of the supersymmetry. So we start out with um, like a local Lorentz group in physics language, which is SO1, 9. And this sort of breaking up here, there are associated groups with these 4D space, which is and 6D space, which are SO1, 3 and SO6. And you can ask how the 16 representation, the spinner of SO1, 9, transforms under each of these groups, how it transforms under, say, the local Lorentz group on, on the compact space X. Um, and that's very easy to work out. It works like this. So. so you start with 16 supercharges. Um, under SO1, 3, four of them, there are four sets of vial spinners. Right? So you have four vial spinners and four antivial spinners, making a total of 16 components under the SO1, 3 group. And these four vial spinners get rotated into each other as the spinner representation of SO6. You can do a, a Lorentz transformation on the internal space. Okay. So we'll, our spinner splits up according to our ansatz as well. And now we can just plug our ansatz into our, um, what I'll probably refer to as killing spinner equations, but into our supersymmetry transformations and just see what we get. So one equation we have is the four-dimensional component. This. Yeah. The four-dimensional co component of the Gravitino variation. And because I've set this flux with any leg in the four dimensions to zero, this is just the levi chavita connection of a maximally symmetric space acting on the 4D part of the spinner gives zero. Okay. Um, and if I want to satisfy that, um, there's an integrability condition. You can just form this object. That has to be zero. Obviously, if, if this is zero, so is this. You just adding some extra stuff and contracting. And you can find very simply that because of this sort of an anti-commutator of derivatives in here, if you play with it, you'll find that this implies that the curvature in 4D space-time is zero. So in other words, we've got a curvature zero maximum symmetric space, so this is actually Minkowski space. Okay. So that's the boring bit. I could have just taken Minkowski space times x as an ansatz in the first place if I wanted to. What do we have left? What are the spilling, killing spinner equations we have left? Well, first of all, we have the remaining components of the Gravitino variation. So they look like, well, just writing out the same thing with a different index on it. Oop. Now we'll have the internal part of the spinner, which is zero. And of course, the Dilatino variation as well. And you can stop at this stage, <coughs> and you can ask, what does this tell me about the manifold x? Right. So I want to preserve n equals 1 supersymmetry. So n equals 1 supersymmetry is one vial spinner and one anti-vial spinner of supercharges. So I want one each of these. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, the Ricci scalar. Oh, 4D. This is my writing, which is bad. So all I'm saying is the 4D curvature is zero. Sorry. And please do ask questions, especially about my handwriting. Okay. So all I'm saying is that this equation implies that it's Minkowski space. Okay, so we want to preserve one each of these external vial spinners. So for this spinner, this 4 of S SO6, this internal spinner, we want to preserve one out of four components. In other words, we want this equation to be true for one out of four components of the spinner. We want to preserve quarter supersymmetry. So what do we know about the manifold? What do we know about the structures on the manifold? Well, we know we have um, a single Nowhere vanishing. Spinner on this manifold. 
Why do we know that? Well, we can parallel transport our spinner around with this connection, so let's know we're vanishing spinner. And a, a manifold, um, a six manifold, which admits a nowhere vanishing spinner is said to admit an SU3 structure. So X admits an SU3 structure. Okay. So why is it called an SU3 structure? Well, just as a quick and dirty aside, so in general, um, the structure group of the frame bundle, if you like, that the, the set of transition functions that are patching together the um, orthonormal frames on your manifold are SO6 transformations. So if you have a spinner on one patch of the manifold, um, and let's have it be the spinner that's a solution to these equations, there's only one such thing, so we'll just rearrange our basis of our spinner such that it appears in the bottom component of the four. In general, if you patch together a manifold, the transition functions acting on spinners lie in SO6 if it's a six manifold. So the spinner of SO6 is the fundamental of SU4. So in general, what you would have if you go between patches, you would have your spinner on one patch, and to get the spinner on the next patch, you would have some SU4 matrix here telling you how they're related. But I know I have this nowhere vanishing spinner, and I can choose to put it in this form on every patch. So this thing has to be another thing of the same form. And this type of form cannot be preserved with an SU4 matrix. If you have a general SU4 matrix here, in general, this component will be rotated up into the rest of the spinner. And in fact, the subgroup of SU4 that you can use while maintaining this form is essentially this. So you have a reduced structure group. This for, the, for the manifold to allow the existence of the spinner, and it's called an SU3 structure because that's what the transition functions lie in, roughly speaking. And this is a completely general thing. So if you look to M theory on a seven-dimensional manifold, right, and you asked, how do I preserve a certain amount of supersymmetry? What you would find is that the general answer is that instead of having SO7 structure, this thing would have to have some reduced structure groups. If you wanted to preserve N equals one, it would be G2. Not just another group. So all you have to do is solve these equations over your manifold to find phi and h in the metric and have a complete description of your supersymmetric background and everything should be fine. The trouble is, is that is unbelievably hard in general. So finding non-trivial examples where you can actually solve these equations and find a background to the theory that preserves four supercharges it's just difficult. So what do you do? Well, you do whatever you do when you hit a problem like that. You specialize even further. Okay. okay. So the specialization that's made, or often made, is to be really quite drastic. First of all, we're just going to set all components of H now to zero. That's clearly going to simplify things quite a lot, but it's also clearly quite drastic, right? setting all this to zero. You also set phi to a constant. And you can see why these simplifications, A, are extreme, you know, they really are extreme, but also why they help. If I set phi to a constant and h to zero, this equation becomes kind of easy to solve. right? This is zero acting on epsilon. So this is actually solved for any of the 16 supercharges. So these two assumptions make the, the Delatino variation zero automatically. The Gravitino variation is also hugely simplified, and we just end up with the variation being the levi civita derivative on the spinner equals zero for a quarter of the supersymmetry. So now, instead of the manifold having to have SU3 holonomy, having um, a spinner that's covariantly constant with respect to some complicated connection, you just need a manifold that has a spinner that's covariantly constant with respect to the, to the metric compatible connection, if you like. And that means that the manifold, instead of just having SU3 structure, has SU3 holonomy.
So uh, I was asked to give this lecture course for starting PhD students, and when I started my PhD, I'm pretty sure I didn't know what holonomy was, so just to say very quickly, if you have a manifold and you start with some vector and you parallel transport it round some closed curve, in general, the vector won't come back to where you started. In general, it'll come back and you'll find that it's been rotated by some angle. If you look at all the curves that go through that point, for example, then you'll get a bunch of different rota possible rotations depending on the curve you choose. And the set of all rotations uh, is a group, and it's called the holonomy group. And in general, if you just pick some random manifold, some random metric, if you like, you'll be able to get any rotation you like. And so in general, this will be SO6, just like the structure group is in general SO6. The fact that this spinner exists and is covariantly constant means that there is one spinner that no matter how you parallelly transport it around your manifold, it stays the same. That's what covariantly constant means. And so the holonomy group must be reduced because there must be one spinner the holonomy group leaves alone. And so by the same argument we did up here, the full holonomy group is reduced from SO6, so SU4 if you like, to SU3. So we get SU3 holonomy. Okay, why does this help us? It's not necessarily obvious, and it's in fact true, that it's not really any easier to find a solution for the metric to this equation than it is to find a solution to the metric in the B field and the thilicon up there. The point is, is that there is a theorem, which I'm not going to state exactly correctly, but good enough for today, by Yao, which is a proof of a conjecture by Calabi, which says that manifolds of SU3 holonomy, so if you like, a manifold with... Um, a metric on it such that covariant tran the parallel transport has this property is one-to-one -one correspondence with Kähler manifolds where the first Chern class of the tangent bundle vanishes. So a Kähler manifold is a manifold of UN holonomy, um, or you can think of it as just a manifold where you can, in complex coordinates, you can get the metric from a double derivative of some function. And C1TX, well, we heard a bit about what uh, first churn classes are today, but in grubby physicist notation, you can also just think of it here as the cohomology class of the curvature 2 form, the trace of the curvature 2 form. So what's the point? The point is, is that finding Ricci flat metrics, finding metrics that have SU3 holonomy on, say, this, uh, on a given manifold is going to be very, very hard, but we never need to do it. What we can do instead is find a Kähler manifold with a vanishing first Chern class, and we know then, thanks to this theorem, that even if we don't know what it is, that there is an appropriate solution somewhere on that manifold. You can put a metric on that manifold even if you don't know what it is. And even today, for most Calabi, even today, analytically, we don't know what the metric on the Calabi hours we use is. We have no idea. Numerically, now we do, to some extent. There are numerical methods for computing the actual metric on a Calabi hour. But what we're going to use instead of trying to, to follow that path is we're going to use the algebraic geometry to actually describe some of the properties of this manifold that we need for the physics. You can't describe everything you need, but you can get a long way. So it's useful to characterize these manifolds in a different way than just it's a manifold with a covariantly constant spinner on it. You can build um, forms out of your spinner instead and describe the manifold with those forms. This is going to be useful to us later on, so I'll just mention it here. By the way, there should be more questions. Um, we're building up slowly, so it may be that people know this, but uh, people should stop me and and ask things. So you can build a two-form out of this spinner that's covariantly constant, this preserved supersymmetry, just by sandwiching some gamma matrices between it and its conjugate. And likewise, you can form a three-form, just to be complete, we'll write it up, which has a real part and an imaginary part. And 
and then you define omega to be omega plus plus i omega minus. Um, and when you do this, you can characterize um, the structure of your manifold instead of by what this spinner looks like, by what these forms look like instead. So in particular, if you just play around with gamma matrix algebra, you'll be able to prove the following relations. Sorry? My omega? <laughs> Sorry. Good. So if you take J, I hope that one's okay. If you, <laughs> if you take J and you wedge together two copies of it, if you just play around with the gamma matrix algebra, you can show that that's going to be equal to omega, omega wedge omega bar. You can show that J wedge omega is zero. And these relations, you can do something very similar for the case of SU3 structure, for the case where instead of this being true, this is true. So in this case, we would also have a spinner. We could also sandwich that spinner on either side of gamma matrices. We could make these same forms or analogous forms, and they would still have these properties. It's just, I'm not using the fact of what this derivative is. This is just some derivative acting on the spinner. I'm just using that spin or whatever it is and sandwiching it between gamma matrices, or on either side of gamma matrices. However, there are other properties that do change. So for example, in the calabi yau space uh, case, these spinners are covariantly constant. And that means that d omega and dj are going to be zero, right? because it's a metric compatible connection. And the uh, derivative acting on these is zero, so if I calculate these d's with that connection, then I'll get a vanishing answer. In the case of a more general manifold of SU3 structure, these two things would not necessarily be zero. You would have something on the right-hand side. And so you can think of, if you like, the specialization that we're making in allowing ourselves to use this algebraic geometry is with insisting that omega and j uh, are closed. OK, so I've been saying as we go along that um, you know, we make this specialization. Oh, yeah, good. No, no, it's got three indices. Um, and you're working in six space. Yeah, it's actually, you're, you're right in that it's actually, uh, I guess you're imagining it's a holomorphic form, which it is. So, but then you've still got three complex coordinates, so you're still OK. It's a top form, so it's kind of unique but uh, up the scale, but you're still okay on dimension grounds. Um, this is a, a real expression, so. Well, I could have, for example, three complex indices and one non-complex. Also, if it's... Yeah, you, you could do it that way. But also, I mean, this doesn't have to be zero, right? Because it could be a one comma three form. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, actually, in the SU3 structure case, you have to be really careful. So when you've got a complex manifold, everything's great. And you can say, ha, this is a th three form, a uh, naught three form, say. So this has to be a one comma three form. But if it's not got a complex structure, if it's an almost complex manifold, then things get more complicated. And this could be a two two form, even. Things get weird. But we're going to concentrate on this case. So everything's OK. It's zero. It doesn't have to be zero. Everyone's happy. Good. Any other? OK. Um, what was I going to do? Yeah, so I've been saying that we're going to be able to describe these club yaws with algebraic varieties. And indeed, we will. And we'll see that as a concrete thing in a, in a few minutes. But how do I know that we can't use algebraic geometry on all the other stuff? How do I know that on the other manifolds of SU3 structure, I can't use algebraic geometry as well? And you have to be careful about how strong a statement you make here. I mean, you, there are certain SU3 structure spaces that are not uh, calabi yau which you can use algebraic geometry to decide certain properties of. However, the following is true, and it tells you, gives you an idea of what the problem is. So you could say, which of these manifolds, so which of these solutions to our string theory, is a projective variety. So which of them can be described as the vanishing locus of a polynomial in projective space? 
single or a single or multiple polynomial quirk equations in projective space. Well, what would we know about such a such a, uh, a manifold? Well, we would know that um, if we use the nice complex structure coming from the projective space, we would know that the, this projective variety is Kähler because the projective space itself is Kähler. There's a known Kähler form on the projective space that gives the Fabini study metric. If you just restrict that to your, you know, you've got your projective space, and then inside you have your manifold living. If you just restrict the Kähler form on the, the, the ambient space, as it's called, the projective space, to the um, manifold, the projective variety living inside it, you get another Kähler form on the, the variety. So we know that this is Kähler and complex. What else do we know? Well, we know we have this three form, which, as I said, is holomorphic. So depending on which way around you do it, you can regard it as having three barred or three unbarred indices with respect to the complex coordinates on the manifold. So we have a nowhere vanishing three form, so naught three form. It's nowhere vanishing because remember this spinner doesn't vanish anywhere in these are gamma matrices. So you've got a nowhere vanishing naught three form and that, a naught three form like that, is a section of the third wedge power the, of the cotangent bundle. Right? A cotangent, an element of the cotangent bundle is just a section of the cotangent bundle is just a one form. This is the anti-symmetric product three times, so I get a three form. So I have a, a nowhere vanishing section of the third wedge power of Tx star. The only, th the third wedge power of Tx star is the top wedge power, so this is a line bundle, so this is a rank one object. There's only one holomorphic naught three form up to scale. So this is a line bundle. And the only line bundle that has a nowhere vanishing section is the trivial bundle. So, you know, the, the fiber the direct product with the, the base space. <coughs> so what all of this means is that C1 of wedge 3 Tx star, of whatever our, our surface is, is um, the same as C1 of the trivial bundle, which is 0. But C1 of wedge 3 star, there's sort of rules for how these C1s behave under wedging and so forth. This turns out to be the same as minus C1 of Tx, the first Turing class of the tangent bundle itself. So that's 0 as well. If you didn't follow all the arguments, it doesn't matter. The point is this. If you want to describe one of these SU3 structure spaces as a projective variety, then it's going to be a manifold which is Kähler and has vanishing first Chern class. And that's a club, yeah. So you're stuck. Right? If you want to describe these more complicated spaces as algebraic varieties, something in the rather dodgy argument I gave would have to go wrong. Okay, so we're going to look at um, being careful not to take these statements we've made too seriously in a second. Um, but I just want to say something about how general these arguments are, about solving killing spinner equations, looking at what kind of derivative operator you have um, with a, a covariantly constant spinner with respect to it, um, and how algebraic varieties arise. This is a completely sort of general type of thing in string theory. So if I type, took, instead of heterotic string theory, type 2 string theory, and I said the same thing, you know, you'll hear people say, I mean, they may add extra words like orientable, but they'll say things like, I'm going to compactify type 2 string theory on a club Yao, so I end up with n equals 2 supersymmetry in four dimensions. What are they doing? They're doing exactly the same analysis. They're writing out the, the supersymmetry transformations in that case. There's one extra spinner there. That's why they get two supersymmetries and not one. But then they'll follow through exactly the same analysis, ask how they solve those killing spinner equations, make the same specializations from a general structure to uh, a special holonomy. And then when they've done all of that, they'll get to the very similar conclusions that they can describe their club yeah, as a, an algebraic variety and so forth. Another thing people will say is, ha, I have brains in my setup, so I have, you know, I have my manifold. So if you imagine now this is the club yeah, and then I'm wrapping some D brain around a cycle, some extended object around a cycle in the Calabi they'll say, aha, to preserve supersymmetry, I take my 
space to be a Calabi Yau and my D brain to wrap a holomorphic cycle. <laughs> How did they get this information? How did they know what the D brain had to wrap to preserve supersymmetry? Well, they just do exactly the same type of calculation. You would have a 10 dimensional action on, the, on your original space time, just as we did, but then you would also have some dimensional action depending on the size of your D brain for fields just living on the extended object. That's going to be a supersymmetric theory. They'll have fermionic variations. You'll do a similar type of story. Ask when do those fermionic variations give you zero? When do you preserve supersymmetry? And you'll find it's when this cycle is holomorphic, if that's what they're taking the answer is. So this is a really general thing. You can get a long way. And often the reason uh, algebraic geometry comes into string theory is because of preserving supersymmetry. I should say another reason it comes in is that um, moduli spaces are often vacuum spaces, if you like, are often algebraic varieties. And one reason of seeing why that may be true is you know that the n equals 1 supersymmetric theories have a, a Kähler manifold as their, their field space. So if you're talking about you know, vacuums in, inside a Kähler space, then there's a chance it's going to be an algebraic variety. And we'll see more of that in the third lecture. Okay. So this is the general picture. And before I knock any holes in it, does anyone want to ask anything else? Yeah. There are certainly non-supersymmetric vacuoles here. Uh, no, supersymmetric vacuoles. Yeah, oh, I see. Yeah, there's certainly supersymmetric vacuoles here that are non-Kähler too. Okay. Right, these are these SU3 structure cases that we looked at. In, in general, these won't be Kähler manifolds. In general, they're not even complex. But what you, uh, all I was giving with the club, is, uh, and all of that will happen in type 2 as well. So there's, you know, there's these sp special structure manifolds which are really general. They can be many different types of things, but of course you've got very few tools to deal with them. That's the case you'd really like to attack, right? That's the general problem. But then we make these specializations because basically we don't know what we're doing there. So then we make a specialization where we can deal with the manifold, and that's where the algebraic geometry comes in. Yeah, thanks, Lydia. People make two strong statements about this type of thing, and this is particularly relevant in my field of, of string phenomenology, where people will try to claim you have to look at a certain type of manifold because of this kind of argument, which is not true. So I just want to say a few words about that before we move on to talk a little bit about F-theory. So this is just a, an aside about be careful what you state. So here's a statement that someone might make that on the sound of it sound the face of it sounds reasonable. They may say without flux, so if h equals zero and phi equals constant, then you must compactify on a Calabi Alf threefold, which is often written like that, to get an n equals one theory. in four dimensions. So this is a statement that people will make. And, and on the face of it, this looks reasonable. Isn't this what I just said? Right? We had this general case, and then I specialized to the case where h was 0 and phi was constant, and we got a Calabi our threefold. So what's, why is this, in fact, not quite true? The reason it's not quite true, and this may seem like a pedantic point, but I'll explain why it's important in a minute is that there's a difference between the amount of supersymmetry of a theory and the amount of supersymmetry of its solution. Right. So what we just showed is that the solution of this 10-dimensional theory, if it's going to preserve n equals 1 supersymmetry, then the space would have to be a Calabi L. But you can do something more general, um, and, and let's have a look at what that is. So there's a really ni nice discussion of this in a paper by Dan Waldrum and his collaborators which I recommend if you read nothing else, just read the introduction of this paper. It will change the way you think about this type of stuff. And the example I'm going to give you is by Lucas and Matty. And they presented this example and many others in this paper. So what are we going to do instead? What are we going to do differently? Well, we're going to change the ansatz we had at the start. And instead of asking to preserve n equals 1, 
we're going to ask initially to preserve n equals a half supersymmetry. Now, this may seem like a crazy thing to do because n equals a half supersymmetry, especially if you're doing phenomenology, is no good to anyone. But let's just do it and see where we get. So we're going to make an ansatz for the metric this time. We'll still set uh, phi and h to 0 just for simplicity, phi to a constant. But we will take the, the ten-dimensional space-time to be a three-dimensional Minkowski metric, not four. Um, one extra dimension with a sort of a warp factor out the front of it um, that looks like this. I'll explain what this is in a second. And then a manifold of SU3 structure, uh, dxu dx nu here. And this is a function of xi here. So what I mean by these xi's is this metric is a function of the six-dimensional space and this y-coordinate. This co coefficient out the front here, which actually doesn't matter very much in this case, but this coefficient out the front here is a function of y and of this six-dimensional space. You can pretty much forget about that coefficient. But, yeah. And what you can do is you can say, given this set this ansatz, and given that instead of preserving four supercharges, I just want to preserve two, n equals a half, do the same analysis, see what you get. And we can write those forms we had, my poorly written omega and j, and you can write them in this case, and you can ask what sort of relations do they obey? They're going to obey this omega wedge omega is j wedge j wedge j. They're going to obey j wedge omega equals zero. But what about the differential bits, the, the bit that was zero for a Clarbial? So you find in this case that d omega minus is still equal to zero. Right, the imaginary part is still zero. You find this equation, which is still looking good. But you also find the following. The y derivative of j appears and gives you a non-zero d omega plus, so it's not closed anymore. So there's also the exterior derivative of this thing appearing. And similarly, dj is not zero anymore either. OK, so note that if I took away all the y dependence, so I, I made this basically 4D Minkowski space again, um, and this became naught, so this was just, as I said, the Minkowski space. This would all vanish, and you'd get back to the Calabi-Yau case. But if you allow yourself to preserve n equals half of the solution, rather than n equals 1, this SU3 structure can be something else. It doesn't have to be a Calabi-Yau. It can be something more general. Why do you care? Well, you can do the following thing. How, how is this going to give you an n equals 1 theory? So what we're going to do is we're going to find an n equals 1 theory in four dimensions which doesn't have a Minkowski space ground state. Instead, it's going to have a ground state that's a domain wall solution. It varies in one direction, and that's going to be this. So what you do is you, in, when you do the dimensional reduction, is you keep complete n equals 1 multiplets. in the dimensional reduction. What do I mean by that? Well, you've got this SU3 structure space, and that picks out a particular spinner. Right? When we do the spinner decomposition and we've got this 2 comma 4 plus 2 bar comma 4 bar, it picks out a particular vial spinner and a particular anti-vial spinner by choosing an element of the 4. So what you do is when you do your dimensional reduction, if you keep a given field, you keep anything that's related to it by one of those supersymmetry transformations. Right? You keep complete multiplets under this n equals 1 supersymmetry, and when you do that, you're guaranteed to get an n equals 1 theory. Right? They're just The original action is invariant under that symmetry. You're keeping everything that gets muddled into everything else under the symmetry. The action will still be n equals 1. So what goes wrong, because this only preserves n equals a half? Well, like I said, the vacuum will be an n equals a half solution. And when you look at what that n equals a half solution looks like, it's exactly the four-dimensional manifestation of this domain wall solution. So you can compactify it on a manifold of SU3 structure 
rather a, a more general manifold of SU3 structure and not just on a Calabi L, and you can get an N equals 1 theory, it's just that it won't have a Minkowski space vacuum. It will have a domain wall. Yeah. Uh, can we put just uh, one uh, for, uh, the Yeah, because when we do this 16, decomposes as 2, 4 plus 2, 4 bar. Okay. One quarter of the supersymmetry, so n equals 1 supersymmetry, is keeping one of those and one of those. The SU3 structure, dead. The SU3 structure picks out one covariantly constant spinner on the internal manifold and one anti. And so that's the spinner that you keep the complete multiplets of. And so the n equals one, your theory in four dimensions would be n equals one. If you kept everything, if you kept all collusive Klein states of everything, then the, the theory would have as much supersymmetry as, you, as the theory you started with. It would just look weird. But if you just complete, keep complete multiplets under this particular n equals one supersymmetry that's picked out, it will be an n equals one theory. But the vacuum, as I said, will be n equals half. And in this paper, they actually give you the theory. They give the superpotential. They find the solution for the vacuum in this theory, the, the supersymmetric vacuum, and they show that the two agree. So what's going on here? Well, let's have a, a, a maths what's going on and a physics what's going on. Or a maths what's going on and a physics, I still don't see why I care. Um, so the maths of what's going on is I have this y direction, this extra direction in four-dimensional space, which is sort of split off from my three directions where, where something's varying. In particular, if I look at the SU3 structure manifold over this direction, it changes as I go along this direction. And what's happening, the reason you're getting an n equals a half solution here is that this direction together with this six-dimensional manifold forms a seven-dimensional manifold. And that seven-dimensional manifold has SU3 holonomy, uh, has G2 holonomy. So these are basically a, a very slight generalization of something called Hitchin's flow equations. And what this does is tell you how to take an SU3 structure guy and fiber it over um, a, a line to get something of, of G2 holonomy. No, it's not compact because this, this y direction is one of our four-dimensional space directions. Good question. Yeah, but it, it's still got G2 holonomy. And this is going to shoot my next dodgy argument in the foot. If you imagined, even though it's non-compact, if you imagined hiding those extra dimensions, right, then the same sort of argument that says that if you compactify to, to 4D, you need SU3 structure, SU3 holonomy, the same sort of arguments would tell you that this ought to be G2 holonomy if I don't have any h or any phi, which I didn't. Okay, so basically, this is oh, all I'm trying to say is if you combine this six-dimensional manifold with a line, this is basically Hitchin flow, something called Hitchin flow. You're building manifolds of a, a G2 holonomy in seven dimensions. If you went for a more complicated thing and put the flux back in and all that sort of stuff, you'd get some big generalization of Hitchin flow, where this is some manifold of G2 structure. That's the idea. And they do more complicated cases in, in, in their lecture. Physics-wise, why do we care still? If I looked at this 4D theory, there would be a vacuum solution where one spatial direction had all the fields varying, and we live in Minkowski space. So, so if I was trying to use this phenomenology, why would I care? Well, when people are using these kinds of compactifications, they add in all sorts of effects beyond the sorts of perturbative physics we've just used. So when they're trying to do things like stabilize moduli, you may have heard of the KKLT scenario and all this sort of stuff, they'll add in lots of non-perturbative effects from instantonic brains wrapping cycles and, and gageno condensation, all these sorts of non-perturbative effects. And what you want is some kind of Minkowski vacuum after you've added all that back in. You don't necessarily need it to be Minkowski at the perturbative level. And in fact, yeah, well... KKLT wasn't in type 2B. That would be an example of that. Um, there is a lot of uh, problems with this kind of approach. In general, this, there's only one energy scale in the problem, which is the size of the compact manifold. So in general, the variation here will be a variation with sort of an energy scale at the compactification scale, and so you shouldn't really be describing this in a 4D theory in the first place. It's a, it's, it's a, a very violent behavior. But you may be able to tune it, and this is what these people try and do, you may be able to tune it so that this variation is very slight and can still be treated in a 
4D context. Okay, I'm just mentioning that because that sort of thing is becoming popular in the literature right now. Let's skip on something more solid. Um, let's just talk about one other way in which algebraic varieties appear in string theory, which on the face of it looks nothing like what I've been talking about. Unless there's any other questions. So I'm sure uh, more qualified people than me are going to talk about F theory in this uh, um, this uh, lecture uh, series of uh, lectures, but I'm just going to give a very <laughs> rudimentary introduction to F theory just so that we can look at the conditions people talk about for preserving supersymmetry in it and why that gives rise to algebraic varieties. So it's going to look like a different thing on the face of it, but it's going to turn out to be the same kind of argument. So what is F theory? So in 2B string theory, so in just one of the other string theories, there is a scalar field called the axiodiliton. which looks like, is often called tau, and it just looks like this. It's, it's the, the scalar field we had earlier, essentially, and something called the ramon ramon naught form. So it's just some scalar field, it's just some scalar field in the theory, and often what you're interested in is, is solutions to the theory where this scalar field varies. And what people do is they describe Uh, this scalar field is the complex structure of a two torus. Okay, so if you have um, just you have the complex plane and the complex coordinate on it, and you just make the usual identifications. Oops. So you have two complex numbers, lambda 1 and lambda 2. Um, you identify under integer, mul integer multiples of those two complex numbers. Then the complex structure of this torus is just lambda 2 over lambda 1, which better not be real. right? I mean, these two vectors better not point in the same direction. You're going to want the torus to be compact. And there are many reasons why, why people use... So what they do is they have the 10-dimensional space-time, and everywhere over their 10-dimensional space-time, they imagine having this torus. And the complex structure of this torus varies over the 10-dimensional space-time, and how it varies is supposed to describe this scalar field. And there's, there's many reasons why you would describe a scalar field like that. One of the main ones is there's singularities, um, which are essentially sources for this field, and they correspond nicely, the physical singularities you get correspond nicely to the ways in which a, a torus can go funky. But the, the statement I'm interested in for today is something different. What people do is they imagine compactifying type 2b down to, if you like, down to four dimensions on a six-manifold, which together with the torus is going to make an eight-manifold. And what people will say is the following kind of statement. They'll say that F theory on a Calabi-R fourfold gives rise to an n equals 1 theory in four dimensions. So what they mean is this, this, this six-dimensional base with this torus over it combined as um, a complex four-manifold or as a, an eight-manifold is a Calabi R fourfold, and then you preserve n equals 1 supersymmetry. And on the face of it, that looks like it must come from a very different argument from the type we've been using. What we've been saying is what you do is you look at the action on now this 12-dimensional space, and then you vary the fermions and you see what symmetry. But you don't have a 12-dimensional action here, right? There's no 12-dimensional action of F theory. There's this torus is just a trick for describing a scalar field, essentially. So where does this statement come from? What is this? Well, what you do is you use some dualities. And basically, there's never that many ideas in physics, right? So you relate the case you don't know how to do back to a case that looks the same as the one you do. So what we do is we use some dualities to relate this 
statement back to somewhere where we can do our usual analysis of a killing spinner equation and try and get a solution. So the two dualities we're going to use are the M theory. So this is the 11-dimensional theory um, on a circle. Is by S duality the same thing as type 2A string theory. And in fact, the type 2A coupling is roughly speaking just the radius of the circle over the string length. So if you take this circle, you, you take your 11 dimensional space time to be a circle times something. If you take the circle to zero size, you go back to weakly coupled to a string theory. So how do people know this? Well, there's a nice description of this in a paper by Witten called String Theory in Various Dimensions, I think. Um, and, and what they do, the way they, they see that this is true, is there's certain states in type 2A string theory which are BPS. They're, they're supersymmetric and they're protected, in s certain quantities are protected against quantum corrections. So this postulated. So what you do is you take those states, you look at their spectrum, and then you take the limit that the coupling goes large. You believe your results still because of this protection, and what you see is the kaluza klein tower of a reduction of M theory on S1. So there's, there's some duality that relates M theory on S1 to just type 2, where the S1 has disappeared. There's also T duality, which relates type 2A theory on an S1. to 2b on S1. This is just some, if you like, some canonical change of variables on the world sheet. That's one way of thinking about it. And when you do that, the, um, the, the 2b coupling is given by the 2a coupling over the radius of the circle. And so the idea to get from F theory is to get from M, th M theory to F theory using these dualities. And what you do is you just combine the two circles and you make these our torus directions. Okay. So I'm just going to do it for a square torus because it avo avoids me having to think about um, form fields. So I'm going to look, say that M theory on a square T2 times something is the same as 2B on just that something times r. So, so why, what I'm doing, we're taking these T2s, one direction is this circle, one direction is this circle, and I just shrink the size of the torus to zero. And as I do that, as this direction shrinks, I go to 2A string theory with this coupling, and when I shrink this circle, I go to 2B string theory with this coupling. So the final 2B coupling Thank you. Okay, so take the limit that S1 goes to infinity. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So the 2B coupling in this case is the 2A coupling LS over RT, which is just from this formula here, just going to be RS over RT, the ratio of the size of these two circles. But that is the complex structure, or at least the imaginary part, because we did a square torus, the imaginary part of the complex structure of our torus. So if you take M theory on T2 and you squeeze it down, you get 2B theory on this space. And if you squeeze this torus to zero size, this will go and just become R, the S1 will expand out. Where the complex structure of the torus gives this, this field profile. So that is F theory. OK, so what do we do now? Well, now we want to compactify. Instead of just having a direct product here, we want to compactify on some non-trivial manifold and get down to a four-dimensional theory. So what you do instead is you fiber T2 over um, M3 times 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, M6. So you take M theory on a T2 fibration over this six-dimensional manifold times a three-dimensional manifold. And you do the same set of dualities. And just because if you look on the six-dimensional manifold, locally the fibration always looks trivial, 
you get the, the argument is that they call it the adiabatic approximation, but you can do the same set of um, um, dualities, and what you'll get is instead of 2b on when you take the limit flat space, you'll get 2b on M6 with this torus, the F-theory torus, fibered over in the same way. Excuse me. Okay, so how does all of this help us with supersymmetry? Well, the idea is this. I want to know why this T2 fibration over the six-dimensional space should be um, a Calabi-R fourfold. What I do is I look at M-theory, 11-dimensional theory, on that Calabi-R fourfold, compactifying down to three dimensions. There, there is an action. There is some way we can do the calculation, and we can work out the theory with a certain amount of supersymmetry we get. In fact, Michael with Yan Louis worked this out with some fluxes on it, for example. You can actually do the calculation and work out how much supersymmetry you can preserve. But according to duality, this is the same as F-theory on the same space. So you use the same techniques, but you use some dualities to relate the case to, a, to relate the, the statement about supersymmetry to a case where you actually have an action. Okay, so finally, that's all I'm going to say about preserving supersymmetry, and we're just going to go on to briefly meet that. So today has been quite wordy. We've just been talking about why you're interested in algebraic geometry, where it comes from, how general these techniques of solving killing spinner equations are. Tomorrow, we're actually going to go on to start doing some proper calculations. And when we do that, we're going to be working on examples of Calabi R threefolds. So I'm just going to introduce the examples of Calabi R threefolds we're going to be working on um, so that we're ready to talk about vector bundles tomorrow, which is what we'll go on to. So how to choose um, a set of Calabi R threefolds to work on um, to give examples that are going to be giving you an idea of what goes on in the subject as a whole. So it's pretty difficult, but I've decided that we, and partly because they're, again, things I work with every day, we're going to use a set of Calabi R threefolds called the complete intersections in products of projective space. Now, this is a very small, really, This is a very small set of Calabi R manifolds. There's only some 7,000 of them. Um, but they have some nice features. One is that it's a, a big enough set that you see lots of different types of structure in there, which we'll see. Another is, is that they illustrate the general principles of how people often describe Calabi R's in this subject. Um, and in particular, the technology that we'll develop to calculate things on these Calabi R threefolds directly applies as well to the biggest data set of Calabi R's known, the hypersurfaces and toric ambient spaces. So you can learn a lot by studying these simple cases. They're a lot simpler to deal with than the torics, um, but you learn the techniques that you'd need to know. And to, to, to introduce what these are, it's easiest to give an example. So these are completely classified, the, the, the manifolds are known, and they're determined by a matrix, or they're, they're written as a matrix, which looks, for example, like the following. This is called the bicubic. And this, this matrix defines a Calabi R threefold. So what do we have here? Well, the basic idea of, of this construction is that, as you know, with all algebraic varieties, you're going to describe your complicated Calabi R manifold and have some calculation control by embedding it in something simpler. The simpler thing is called the ambient space, and the ambient space here is just going to be a direct product of P2 times P2. And that's what this first column is. Okay. So we have our ambient space, and as we were hearing today, we're going to describe the, the variety inside this by the vanishing locus of a homogeneous polynomial in the projective of the homogeneous coordinates of these projective spaces. So we have the vanishing locus of some polynomial as the Calabi L. And this is determined, what the, the polynomial is, is determined by this <coughs> column. So the idea is, is that the Calabi L is the vanishing locus of a bicubic polynomial. So the way it works, um, 
is each time you have a column, the numbers here give you the degree of the polynomial in the homogeneous coordinates of the associated ambient space. So another example would be if I wrote down a manifold called the quintic, this is defined by a, a quintic polynomial in the homogeneous coordinates of P4 and where that vanishes. So in general, you can have several products in your ambient space, so this can go on and on and on, um, and you have to define the, the degree of the polynomial in each, in each piece of the ambient space. In general as well, you can have more than one equation. So the Calabi-Yau manifold can be the intersection of two polynomial equations if you start with a big enough ambient space. And if that's the case, you know, if there was more P's here and there was more than one equation, you just have several columns, one for each equation. And like I say, there's some rules for when these things are Calabi-Yau, which we'll see next time. And you can just go through and classify these. What else do we have here? Well, we have this and we have this number. What are these? Well, these are the number of harmonic H11 forms, 11 forms and the number of harmonic 12 forms on the manifold. And again, we'll know how to calculate these next time. So these are H11 and H12. And we're actually going to consider a special type of complete intersection, calabi -Yau, that has a special property. It's very much linked to its ambient space. It's not, it, it has extra detail that you can gain about the calabi -Yau living inside the ambient space because of a property called favorability. So as always, there are several different um, definitions of favorability in the physics literature. So I'm going to tell you which one I'm using and be careful not to be confused. So what I mean by that is that H11 of this manifold is 2. And there is two projective spaces. Now I can get one harmonic form on this manifold by restricting essentially the Kähler form of this P2 to the surface. I can get another one by restricting the Kähler form of this P2. But that completely gives me a basis of my one harmonic 11 one forms on this manifold. So very roughly, favorability means that all harmonic 11 one forms descend from the ambient space. We will see when we start writing sequences up what that really means next time. But the thing I want to leave you with is, again, the way you deal with these manifolds is having them embedded inside something simple. The reason that this is a useful property is it's another property of the Calabi L that's directly coming from the ambient space. So I keep telling you this is a calabi -Yau. Why should you believe me? How do you know that this is a calabi -Yau manifold? So what we're going to do is we're going to do the really stupid way of figuring out this is a calabi -Yau manifold today. And I suggest you try it uh, at home. And then tomorrow, um, we'll do the sensible way of proving this is a calabi -Yau manifold using the algebraic geometry. And then you'll see why algebraic geometry is a good thing, because you'll see how much work it's saving you. I really sold you doing that calculation, didn't I? Okay. okay. So how do we know this is a calabi -Yau manifold? Well, here's the, the, the stupid way of seeing this. Okay, what do we need? We need it to be Kähler. Yeah. And we need C1 of Tx to be 0. Okay, this is clearly Kähler. I mean, it, it's a, a complex sub-manifold of a Kähler manifold. Just restrict the Kähler form. This is a Kähler manifold. So this one's okay. What about C1TX? Well, this is the cohomology class of the trace of the Kovacs 2 form, as I said. So this is something that basically you need the metric to work out. So you may think, well, there we're stuck. I have no idea what the Ricci flat metric is on this space. We know metrics on, on P2 times P2. There's the Fabini Studi metric. So we could take the Fabini Studi metric and we could restrict it to the Calabi L, but that's not the Ricci flat metric. That's not the metric with SU3 holonomy. So how am I going to calculate C1TX? Well, we're going to use the fact that it, it doesn't matter, given the complex structure, for example, it doesn't matter which metric you calculate this with, it will always give the same answer. So if you take um, the metric, the Fabini study metric on P2 times P2, restrict it to, say, the, cubic the bicubic hypersurface inside P2 times P2, 
you then work out the trace of the curvature tooth form, you should be able to write that as a total derivative. And you can do it. It works. I haven't actually done it for the 3-3. Three three. I've done it for the quintic, and it works. So that means that just by knowing about how this surface lives in the ambient space, we've been able to figure out these are Calabi Yau. We'll find a much better way of doing that tomorrow that doesn't involve all this differential geometry stuff. Um, and uh, that will be very helpful. So I'll just say a couple of more things. Um, so first of all, we can already see some moduli of the Calabi Yau, and this will be an important thing for us tomorrow. Or actually, yeah, tomorrow in the third lecture. So, complex structure. So we have this defining polynomial, P, which um, tells us where the Calabi Yau is in the ambient space. And P is just sum, sum over terms with coefficients of all the possible polynomials which are cubic in both um, the, the coordinates of both, uh, the homogeneous coordinates of both P2s. So schematically, these, these monomials are something of the form x cubed, y cubed, where, you know, and x1, x2 squared, and so forth, where x is the homogeneous coordinates of this P2 and y is the homogeneous coordinates of this P2. But you can see, you know, all I've specified in giving the Calabi Yau is the degrees. I haven't actually given you an actual polynomial. And as I change these coefficients, this guy is going to move around inside the ambient space. But all you need for it to be Calabi Yau is that the degrees are right. So these are moduli. Right? If, you, if you change these coefficients, the Calabi Yau will move and morph and change, but it will still preserve supersymmetry. It will be, still be supersymmetric. So these are, in fact, a redundant description of the complex structure moduli. Why are they redundant? Well, again, we'll see this properly tom uh, tomorrow when we do vector bundles, in particular, look at what the tangent bundle of this thing looks like. But they're redundant um, because, for example, if you imagine scaling all of these coefficients in the same way, multiply them all by 2, you don't change what the zero locus of the polynomial is. So it's clear that the overall scale of the, the, the polynomial won't move the Calabi out. I can just put a scale out the front here, and it still has the same solution for p equals 0. So it's clear that while these are a set of moduli of the theory, that they're a redundant description of those set of moduli. And exactly how you get back to the proper description we'll see tomorrow. In fact, this is supposed to be the number of complex structure of the, of the Calabi Yau. And if you work out the number of bicubic monomials, you find out there are many, many more. So that's this redundancy. OK, last comment I'll make. Um, here we've been talking about threefolds, but this same construction of Calabi Yau can be used to construct Calabi Yau fourfolds for use in F theory. So let's just have a five second look at that. So the Calabi Yau fourfolds are not um, classified. The, the Fourfolds, uh, complete intersection fourfolds in product of projective spaces are not classified yet, but I'm doing this with Alexander Haupt, uh, Andre Lucas, and Yang He Hur, and it should be available by Christmas. So Alexander Haupt has written this code that generates all these different matrices, and it's nearly finished. There's about 90,000 of these so far. It's probably about 90% done. So if we want to make Calabi our fourfolds, we just do exactly the same sort of thing. We have some ambient space, and then we describe the Calabi Yau as a surface inside that. So Here's an example. Let's take our fourfold to be ambient space of P2 times P2 times P2. And let's have two equations now. So the so six minus two is four, so we've got a fourfold. And our two equations are going to be cubic in the first P2, linear and linear in the first P2, and something that doesn't depend on the homogeneous coordinates of the first P2 at all, and by, by quadratic in the remaining two P2s. And the reason I've chosen this one is it has another property which is useful for, for this F-theory stuff. So there are general conditions for when a Calabi-Yau threefold is elliptically fibred. You can check it. 
I mean, maybe some people in the audience can correct me here. I don't know of the analogous conditions for Calabi R4 folds, for in general knowing whether it's elliptically fibered. It may be that that exists, but I don't happen to know it. But this Calabi R4 fold is obviously elliptically fibered. So let's just see why that is. So what do we have here? Well, let's just consider this... Um, this equation first, what does this look like? If we don't impose this equation, but just look at the ambient space and this one, what do we have? Well, this equation doesn't depend on P2 at all, the first P2. So I just have, we'll call this X, the base. So X is just going to be P2, this one, times this equation inside P2 times P2. So this is just some three-dimensional, sorry, that's x. k is just p2 times x. So this is just some variety in times p2, p2. It's not a Calabi L, just some threefold. And we've got a direct product of that with p2. Okay, great. What happens when we impose the second equation? Well, imagine choosing a point on x. So choosing values for the homogeneous coordinates here such that we solve this equation. That will give us a value for this linear piece and a value for this linear piece. And over each point on the base, what we will get is a cubic equation in the homogeneous coordinates of P2 describing a one-dimensional variety. So we get this sort of cubic in P2 fibred over this base space. And a cubic in P2 is a torus. So it's, uh, uh, it's got the right genus, and it's uh, 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 obviously it's a Calabi L. So just by looking at the configuration matrices, which is what these matrices are called, in some cases you can see if something's elliptically fibred or not, and then you can do all the rest of this stuff. Okay, I'm running out of time, so I will just say what we did and then what we're going to do tomorrow. So all we've done today is we haven't really looked at any algebraic geometry at all, really. All we've done is discussed where does algebraic geometry come from in string theory. And most of the time, it comes from trying to solve a killing spinner equation to preserve a certain amount of supersymmetry, even if it's doing that rather indirectly. These supersymmetry transformations can be supersymmetry transformations on brains. They can be supersymmetry transformations on the total space-time. But the same kind of principle tends to work. We saw that, in general, if, if you want to look at the most general types of solution that preserve supersymmetries, they, supersymmetry, they are not going to be algebraic varieties. So we are specialising hugely to be able to use this technology most of the time. Given that, we better get a really big payoff for having had to make that specialisation. And what we're going to see in the next lecture is exactly what that payoff is. So in the next lecture, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about how you construct vector bundles over different types of vector bundles over these types of space, particularly the free folds. And then how you use those vector bundles to calculate more, both about the manifold and about, for example, gauge field beds on the manifold themselves. Um, yeah, and I'll stop there for today. Is there any more questions? The only silence that was late. People wanted to go. Ah. <coughs> the, the analysis you did to start with, you said that's for heterogeneous. Yeah, just because I only wrote down for example. Does it work the same way for Yeah, and it, you know, basically it works the same for everything. I mean, you, so if you did the same analysis in type 2, it would be the same if you had two students instead of one. But it's basically the same analysis. And that's why it's an interesting thing to look at, right? I mean, basically you do the same thing. structure stuff just for an introduction to it but also as a way into the literature to see why that is the um, an interesting thing to look at. I really recommend this reference I did put up in the middle which was this reference of 
Miku, Waldrum, and other people I don't remember, but you can find it on the ePrint archive here. They have a lovely introduction where they go through this description. I hope no one in the audience is on that paper, I'm going to get killed. Um, they have this lovely introduction just in words, of, like I said, but then they have obviously the, the detailed mathematics written out. For the stuff um, with the domain wall solutions, which is related, there is this paper by um, uh, Lucas and Matty, which was the other number I gave. But then for the Calabi our spaces that we've just been talking about, and in particular for the technology that we're going to use tomorrow, um, for the bundle technology, I'll give you the references at the start of the lecture tomorrow. But there is a book by Tristan Hupsch, which is uh, called yeah. A Calabiao manifold, Calabiao manifolds, and Albrecht will be able to tell me whether I get the name. I think it's a best tree for physicists or something. Right. Nay. For last time I looked, this thing was out of print. I don't know if it's back in print, but you can get second-hand copies on Amazon. That's where I got mine. <laughs> you got it recently, so okay, it's back in print. Great. Yes, we don't do naughty illegal things here, Martin. <laughs> okay, but this thing describes these kinds of constructions of Calabi-Yau, but also, you know, other constructions based on, on similar types of, of technology. There's also a thesis that's useful for the bundle stuff, but I'll give you that tomorrow. And then, yeah. I mean, do you know that there are micro vacuum as a microscopic theory? I mean, in the old days, people always worried this was conformal Yeah, I mean, I think you only know conformal field theory on a very restricted number of spaces, right? I mean, y you're taking a limit of the string theory for, so I right, think... Or Calabi on the string theory. Yeah, right. And, you know, even for the non-Rishi flat metrics on the Calabi that you get once you get gauge fields, there's these arguments that you're still doing the right thing. I don't know of an equivalent argument for the SU free structure. I don't know of an equivalent argument. No, so there's some work by Adams, which try, and in fact there's some work by Stefan Group Nibblink, who's here, so he may be the person to talk to, which tries to, to, to do some special cases where you can, of an SU3 structure manifold, where you can write down at least GLSM type stuff. Um, and th this is normally based on some, you make the, the manifold by being a torus vibration over something. Right? Um, but in general, you know, if you ask me, if I have a general, SU3 structure manifold, is that really a vacuum of string theory? I've got no idea. Yeah. It's, a, it's a vacuum of the low energy theory. <laughs>